Hi, good evening everybody. Um, this is Sarah Chiu. Uh, the program is Basket Starfish, our language core. Um, I was talking about uh, the uh, female, the worship of fertility last week. This week I'm going to continue a little bit uh, on how uh, our words are mixed together and how uh, the male uh, took up the female line and pretend that that's the male line. And um, maybe you don't understand what I'm saying now, but you will see from the slides. But before I do that, uh, I'll quickly um, uh, give you an introduction of the yeah of the program. This is Basket Starfish because I've been traveling around for the last thirty something years. Twenty years of them, uh, more than twenty years of them, I've been following the, you know the common core of a of our human language. So this is the Basket Starfish because I believe that every one of us, you know, all the languages are related. No language is isolated. So uh, that we can still find the core of the or the human language. It is only the grammar that separates us, which precisely the linguist you know put a lot of attention in and um, I think the the grammars are just you know like local habit so if we change this way of looking at languages I think uh, we will have more equality and the other thing is uh, I'm a woman I'm from the east so uh, I am presenting a view that is slightly different um, slightly different from the um, male uh, scholars so uh, I'm going to continue today uh, with uh, uh, how the measurement of our female hip, you know, uh, actually affects all our languages and so on. So, uh, one second, let me start the other uh, slides. Okay. Okay, here we are. Okay, um, it's all, uh, we spend, I think, many thousands of years uh, try to hide or transfer the female power in the human society um, to turn the world into this patriarchal society that we lived in today. And if you uh, watch the news, if you do everything, you will see that female always have to prove our the least thing that you think you need to prove, you know. So uh, it is uh, because long time ago, you know, it started, you know, the obsession of a pure male lineage and they wouldn't allow you know any mixing of a pure lineage and which actually caused a lot of war even to, um, into this very day and um, I, today uh, I will uh, versus you know what I will show you today is uh, to show you a lot of remnants of the worship of the female threat or the three male receptacle the female threat is actually the umbilical cord which is actually the the real matriarchal society's lineage and then uh, the receptacle, which is our worm, you know, like a vessel itself that holds the baby. You will see that our language actually have it flip back and forth um, uh, as sound as well. So uh, I will remind you last week what I show you, the Leonardo da Vinci's the Vitruvian men. Uh, I already said that there must be a women's measurement hiding behind this man, like this line right there. Um, I, uh, yeah, I also show you that uh, in the OO dictionary, in Arabic dictionary, it actually uh, says very clearly that the female use, you know, a scarf or a thread to tie around their hip, you know, when they do their belly dance, shaking around, actually is to boast how wide their hip is. Um, this is a very, very common um, practice in the old days. And I sh also show you this uh, 3,000, uh, I mean, 5,500 years old, you know, artifacts that you can still see in in the museum uh, in New York. And actually I have seen them in a couple of different museums. So if a couple of them has survived, you know, so uh, that must be, a, you know, a rather a common thing. And this is a li libation dish, I believe, but you know, the way it made, you know, it's actually very interesting. If we call a Chinese writing, this is an ancient Chinese writing, it's actually um, that bowl right there with the two legs. Can you see that? And um, it's actually uh, in the Chinese dictionary, it's, it explains that it's an 
an official unit of measurement. It says that it is the forearm of a female. Uh, the forearm of the female is normally uh, equal to your own hip. Um, that's the measurement of how wide your hip is to give birth to the baby. And as sound, you know, uh, we actually rhyme with the child, the baby, you know, in Chinese. And, um, and the other uh, picture I want to show you is actually a Chinese oracle writing. This has the sound of Hing. Hing is I, uh, anything to do with brotherhood. You, as you can see, this is whatever splits out from the same bowl right there. And you can hear the sound right there, this hinder part or the hip or the Hing. They are all belonging to the H, the thread word, okay? And then again, you know, I uh, here I will show you why you see what you see. Okay, uh, you if you go to the uh, back to a lot a little bit of ancient time, you will see a lot of traditional ethnic clothes. They will always pay a lot of attention to the hem and to a lot of tassels. You know why is it so? Because since their ancient time, these are not just decoration. They were actually symbolic wishes. You know to have tons of extension of families and children, and you will see that uh, these. Uh, Tassels very commonly found in many many places, and up till now, of course, you know, you go to the desert, you know, the the Bedouins, you know, they are still very using a lot of these things with a lot of ham and things like that. And if you uh, only look at them, you know, you might miss it. I will show you some Jewish, you know, tradition too, and they actually pay a lot of attention to this tassels also. And in the Bible, Ezekiel eight point three, you know, uh, it says that. God God uh, took him by the lock of the hair. This is kind of like a selection. Um, uh, God picked him um, to, to select him as a prophet. And um, as you can see, the tradition goes on and the Jewish people actually paid a lot of attention to the tassel. But uh, I can show you, you know, some of the ancient mummies, you know, when you say a lock of hair is actually um, uh, because they spend a lot of time braiding their hair up like that, exactly the same way that as, as the H writing you will see in a minute and um, and uh, but if you are Jewish you will say that no we call this D D but then uh, in Chinese D is actually mean the seed or the offspring and there is some very odd um, as I based the research in Cantonese Cantonese has a lot of, uh, of sounds that cannot be written and uh, the uh, article you know for hair itself we actually call Za it's Za uh, and we call one za of hair. So the star did zit and z uh, as all rhyme to the child itself. Um, so that's why you will see that a lot of uh, cultures pay a lot of attention to the braiding of hair. And here I will show you real writing. This is a hieroglyph, the he sound, the very guttural H. This is Chinese hai. Hai is also means the lineage and then the system. And then this is in Greek. And then um, that's why three he, just like three braids of hair. You know, the tri is the three, right? So you will see that three he means hair because in ancient times, no one actually go around with their hair, you know, unbraided. So this is the, how they say hair. And then height is also, they describe a long flowing hair or, or sometimes they actually refer to the horse mane. And, but then the height in, in even Chinese, in, in Hebrew, in Arabic, height all, always mean a thread, okay? The sound itself, okay? And then I will refer you to the halat bread. Of course, you know, in English now it's being trans, uh, transcribed as CH, but it is actually pronounced halat. The halat bread is eaten, of course, you know, in celebration. But if you pay attention, you know, the Jewish tradition, the Arab tradition, and also the Greek itself, once you share bread with them, you are considered to be the family. So this uh, halat actually uh, means you are in within the same system. So if you don't believe that, that, I will show you one ancient Greek word, ho. Of course, now again the English will, will uh, transcribe it as ch, but it pronounced it ho. Ho actually means the blood, the God's blood. Okay, this is the bloodline of the God. If you go and uh, search for this word itself, you know you will see that uh, the ancient believe that uh, the ancient God, you know, has a line running inside their body that is blue in color, which actually rhyme together 
with the, the ethnic uh, belief of the um, Jewish people because uh, for them this tassel itself is very important because they believe that there is a blue line running through this tassel and why do they pay so much attention to this blue line and if you pay attention to this blood line you know you will see that a lot of the Hindu people also you know that God always appear as blue in color the Mayan are blue in color and anyway you will see some of the slide later on but I will uh, compare this sound to you, the hem is like this extended thread and hum, hum, all this either in Arabic or in Chinese is always to do with uh, the um, pregnancy itself. Of course, hum in English is also to do with pregnancy or the shape of the belly. And Okay, uh, before I go further on, I want to show you the Eurocentric confusion of writing. Uh, uh, all the others are using, you know, uh, pictographs, so it is actually very easy. This is a uh, hieroglyph, this is Chinese, the Greek uh, began to simplify it, uh, this, this part of the, the cross, and right there, and then um, they use it all to represent the H sound, uh, guttural H sound. In English, you know, when they see the Greek this, they will transcribe it as this, but they will pronounce it as K. Right here, they already confuse the sound, okay? And then if you look at Hebrew, that is the ancient H sound, and this is where your H word come, uh, writing come from, but the Chinese also have the same thing, and um, you see this is where your H form came from, and then gradually uh, there are many, many H you sound, but then the Hebrew, uh, later Hebrew, the Aramaic, uh, summarize it into two different ones, like this, and I already told you, you know, whenever you see this two H sound, it's always to do with the line of the textile of the hair, okay? The Arab uh, the air in Arabic, you know, I will show you one one writing, and then um, you will see that this twisting thread right there. The Chinese also have the same thing, and uh, you will see that if I um, hypothetically, you know, form a form like that with a uh, continuing H, it will actually form a hubble like this. And um, of course there are other H writing to distinguish it from, that's why I just write H without the dot because there are different H right there in the Arabic. Um, but and also Canada, this is a South Indian language, you know, if you according to the linguist fam family tree, uh, you will see that this is um, uh, an Indian uh, family. But why is it that, you know, the similar writing right there is also represented of a syllable ha and also they also use this haga to mean a rope and then I will show you you know also the uh, the English translation whenever they see the H in Arabic they will transcribe it as KH whenever they see this H in Hebrew they will transcribe it as CH and after all whatever you 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 you, you, you transcribe it into um, it will actually uh, hold on you know continue on to become a cord and cord of course you look at this word you still think of a string or a thread right and so so um, they will, uh, they like this again, you know, they already transcribed the sound into a K. So you see this uh, confusion right here. The H sound became the K sound and then the H sound, you know, in English. And also in terms of writing, it become K, H, C, H, uh, also a C and the H. All this represent the K sound or the H sound. You see how confusing it is because you are looking at everything through another lens. Okay, uh, so now I go back to the H word. And so I show you three pictures. What are the common things between this? Why are these words hung and hug and heritage all led by an H writing? Of course, you know, this is the earliest technology of human being. They can always compare this to the snake and you will see that the Chinese Chinese, you know, this is the Chinese legendary uh, uh, ancestor. And in um, Hebrew, in Arabic, Haite and Chet is always to do with a line or the borderline or a thread, okay? And to this side, you know, the Chinese, you know, because we still maintain the uh, pictorial writing, this is what we call Hai, either as a relationship or a lineage or something tied to you. Um, 
and yeah okay then I come back to this side you will see the Haya either means the snake or either mean the life and Chaim in, in, in Hebrew is the life and Ach right here is the uh, brothers and um, I will show you on this same side uh, as, as, to, as soon I mean uh, as long as the sound is concerned uh, we say Hai Haido in Cantonese also means existence. That means your living, your life. Just very similar to the Haya. We say Hai. And then when we use this picture, it means Hing is precisely as this Ah brother. Okay? Um, okay, so you see all this picture right there. The ancient understand it as a rope, a life, or connected to a snake, or something, uh, something related to a relationship, or your kindred. Of course, your kindred is related to your herd because someone tied together and then your home that's why sometimes you, you understand why these things are built in since a long long time ago but then uh, when I'm talking about the herd and the home uh, you have to understand that everything has two extreme when a bloodline you know ties you to one lineage when it ties you down you know this is a real hieroglyph writing and and uh, when the herd is like that this is an uh, age that I form by Arabic writing okay when you are tied up by a hubble that means you are um, not connected to other people because you are in your lineage, you are not in other one's lineage. So it also serves as a hedge, a hurdle. So uh, I hope you understand two extreme. Either you are what the rope also links, but it also divides. Okay, and so um, I show you again the heritage and then the Jewish um, attention to uh, and their rope, and this is a Chinese attention to their rope also. And if you chase, you I'm sure you see all this in souvenir shop but in ancient times only aristocrats you know can wear this uh, tassels because the color or whatever is carrying right here the jade itself tells who you are whose lineage you are so it is exactly the same thing and people pay a lot of attention to the knots right here the same attention the Jewish people will pay attention to the, their own knot, knots in the tassel so this is about the lineage this is the, the, the all they believe it this is to the lineage of God because they were the chosen people and the Chinese ancient Chinese also believe this aristocratic lineage also linked to heaven so basically it's the same thing they all believe that they they are linked to God so um, again now I come to the sound sometimes it divided because you cannot use the each sound for everything they now they call it zit zit and I will show you the Chinese writing, Ji Ji, okay? Ji Ji is actually, as you can see from here, descendants. And in ancient oracle bones, you know, we actually constantly have tons of this writing. It actually, uh, in Cantonese, it will, it will say as Ji Ji, Sun Sun. That means endless descendant. If I write it out in Chinese these days, you have to repeat it two times. Look at this symbol. This is in an oracle bone symbol. Uh, so uh, this is not a new symbol. This is as old as it can be, okay? You don't you think that this is an English, you know, Western world symbol? No, this was used in Oracle Bone many, many times to mean that it repeat twice, okay? So uh, this uh, phrase, it means it endless descendant, ji ji, means ji ji, right there in the Hebrew language. And then the Hebrew, uh, I mean the Chinese Oracle Bone has a truly different writing uh, to, to mean this ji. You will see that we also pay a lot of a lot of attention to the thread or the hair up there somehow and I will compare it with this hang writing you will see that uh, that's how they understood, you know, the, the, the descendant is always from the thread uh, in front and then it go through the worm and the container or the female container, then they split into different descendants. So you will see that the concept of the ancient people. And um, okay, uh, here I will show you, you know, I'll bring you back to the Western world. You will see a lot of Roman mosaic, you know, um, this, uh, you will see this uh, very, very common 
common border. Why are these so common? And then I will show you two writing of the ancient Southern Arabic. You know that this is uh, where uh, Yemen, you know, used to be. Um, I mean, these are the language that they found. You know, a uh, writing they found in uh, ancient Yemen, and this all are the H sound writing. You will see that they are trailing uh, two threads or trailing three threads together. So it has a lot to do with the technology at that time. Okay, this again, this is South Arab Arabian, and this one up here, uh, you see the same, you know, right? But one actually is Hungarian runic. Hungarian runic still maintain the H sound, and then right down here, the same symbol. This is actually um, the. Um, the, uh, back to the South Arabian. In South Arabian, this form actually co uh, carry the S or the Z sound, and and like uh, it actually has a lot to do with thread itself. So you will see that since ancient time, talking about the thread, it has already two ways of expressing it. Either use the H or you use the S. Okay, and I will show you. This is very very consistent. Um, this is uh, Sumerian right there. Hi, it has to do with making thread, and this is uh, a hieroglyph. This is hai he. This is Chinese he. You can see the thread, and back to a uh, uh, Sumerian. This is what they call ash or uh, as. Um, this uh, okay, and this is sa in ancient uh, hieroglyph. And this, as you can see, is a whole, whole, whole uh, hobo, you know, to tie up the whole herd. And this is a Chinese ancient writing. We call it Xin. Xin is actually uh, the thread, or if we change the the um, cons uh, the vowel right there, Xin is actually a thicker thread. So um, it's very, very consistent. So uh, now I will show you this Xin right there. Now I take you back to the Western world, okay? That's Sin is Chinese, but that Sin is you said it's from uh, Greek, okay? It has a lot to do with the female thread, okay? And if you look at the Greek language, uh, the pregnant word is always begin with the Sin, okay? But uh, at this time, you will see that slowly the man is actually taking away the female line, okay? Since they cannot give birth, they will start to use this um, uh, physical thread, you know, that they put on their clothes to take on that thread. This is a Jew Jewish way of showing their, their lineage to God uh, because they cannot give birth, they can, do not have this natural thread. And this is the Chinese, and I will show you this ancient Chinese word. Uh, 2000, more than 2000 years ago, the first emperor of China monopolized this. Can you see that he declared I, the royal I? Since then, no one can use this word. He said I means he is the receiver of the a divine thread, the divine lineage, and um, you will see that that's why all the aristocrats used to wear this. And then uh, you will see that this is the Hindu world, that's why the thread is so important from their god to the normal. Uh, people and then the Greek world as you can see Apollo also somehow uh, wear that physically wear that thread because they don't have this thread okay and then um, from the Western world it actually inherited by all those royal family of the European uh, families you will see that you know even though you know they maintain it but you see the bigger uh, sash still worn by the men the women only get to wear the thinner one and if you ask you know even even uh, um, uh, if if someone marry into the royal family, if they are not from the royal family, they actually don't have the right to wear this thread. This is as serious as it is. It is. They actually still link this thing all the way back to the ancient belief that they are linked to the ancient god. Okay, and then I will show you some writing right there. This hieroglyph either is sesh or sin right there. You will see that the word still exists. The sesh is still this sash okay the sin is still uh, either the sin or the Chinese who say sin in Cantonese it still means the thread the link okay and then this is a Chinese writing sin or sim you will see that how close the sounds are the, this is the writing right there it means to unify someone of course you know up to this very day you are still using a very very ancient symbol whenever you agree with something yeah, but uh, this sash will be worn by the royal family 
family in the in the in Europe, or um, uh, when you use word like same similar, it is still following the ancient tradition because when you unite two things or three things together into one, of course all the Greek word you say synchronized symphony, they are still following that uh, the same line. So you will see that um, the female line is actually uh, robbed, you know, and taken by the male, and that's why this physical threat, you know, is so important in every single way since they cannot give birth, okay? So I, th I have already shown you uh, uh, this picture and this is an, uh, I show you the sexual, as uh, sexual aspect of the languages but uh, I want you to pay a little bit of attention to this shape right there. This is the worm that you will see. The Chinese will say hao right there. Either it means the well, um, uh, a well or it means the gate or it means the mouth. This is where you give birth and, and, and the hao in Arabic, you know, it actually means basin of a water or food and this exactly look like this and I will uh, uh, suggest you to think of the English word how how is also an empty vessel for to hold something so if I read you this how 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 can you hear they are actually the same sound okay so uh, it goes on you know the hum right there has to do the ancient uh, hieroglyph right there it means the worm uh, the the, the uh, uh, water tank okay and this is the vulva and the Chinese has hum right there has to do with uh, pregnancy and hum in Arabic is pregnancy and hum again you know I show you that it has these three different meaning in the dictionary I it means a carry low, which is a baby, it means a sexual intercourse, or it means a random shape, which is the pregnant uh, belly. Okay, so hammer is also means uh, the woman or the donkey because they are always carrying a heavy load. And then uh, hara uh, and in Hebrew means uh, pregnancy, hey in Chinese, in Cantonese also means you know you are pregnant. From this, you will see the thread actually change to the water source. From this onward, you will see uh, we'll keep saying the the I, the I, like this, you know, I, I. So the sound change, but you will see that uh, basically it changed from a water, from the thread to a water container right there. Of course, in Chinese, we're still uh, striving for a power balance, you know, the yin and yang right there. But in a yin on this side, you know, uh, they actually have the aleph, which they rob from the female because they push out this male thing. Okay, once again, you know, I am sorry that I am running out of time right here and I am going very fast, but please excuse me. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Thank you for watching. See you next week.